Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of all combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, good. How's everything over there? I, I know, tell, tell um, the future champion that I said I hope he feels better. Because, yeah, uh, Cameron's been in bed with a uh, stomach bug for the last uh, 24 hours, the poor guy. Yeah, I hope he feels... That's the thing, you know, at that age, you go to school... Hey, you, uh, the thing about school, you go to school for two things. You Hopefully, you go there to learn um, things that you need to have in life, right? To, to become yep. smarter, and you go to get sick. To catch, you know, <laughs> you go to catch everything that all you... <laughs> that, all, that all these <laughs> friends uh, have. You know the the one in the uh, down the hall, the one that's ten seats from you, the one that you see in the lunchroom, uh, whatever they got, you got. You know, it's all about sharing. So <laughs> that's and, it. And then of course they share it with the parents afterwards. You know, they, they you know, say, <laughs> yeah. "Hey, Dad, Mom, I love you guys." You know, all my classmates they shared with me. I got to share with you now. So. Um, well, I give my wife a lot of credit. She's a team player. As soon as he came down in the middle of the night crying because he was sick, she grabs him, goes to the guest room and sleeps in there with him. I didn't even realize they were in there. And I woke up in the morning. I was like, where the hell's my wife? And uh, sure enough, they uh, she's in there in the infirmary. The real wives, the real mothers, you know, when, I mean, when you take on that job and, um, you make that commitment to be an obviously a wife and then a mother. Uh, there's, they are special. They're, there's, you know, they can never get properly, uh, really, enough credit. Yep. I think we all. I think I could probably speak for a large part of the audience. We have nothing but admiration, and respect, and awe. For the mothers out there, you know, the, whether it's a single mom, whether it's a, you know, mom in the projects, a mom in the in the country, a mom, wherever it is, whatever you're dealing with, the ones that they answer the bell all the time, that they they don't stay they don't stay on their they they don't stay on their stool. As a parent and a mom in particular, you'll only ever be as happy as your saddest child. If one of them's hurting. It doesn't matter what's going on with you. You can't help but to feel for whatever they're going through. It's that part of being a parent has, is very trying at times. Because sometimes they're upset about things that don't make sense to us as adults and like little things. And it's like trying to cope with those um, events in their lives is, uh, man, emotionally trying at times. But we've got a ton of action to talk about Yeah, let's about get to today, it real Teddy. quick. I want to just touch on... What a lot of people are thinking about besides the fights, the Super Bowl coming up, right, uh, Ken? Yep. Uh, what, what number is the Super Bowl? I don't know. It's a lot of them. It's 50, I don't even know. What is it? 50 something. And uh, uh, they do the numeral uh, letters. I used to know the numeral Roman, letters. I don't Roman even know how to Roman do Roman numerals. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Roman 50, numerals. 56, 58? 58. So... Here we are, it's coming up, we're a week away, and uh, by the time you see this, it'll only be probably five days a week, you'll see it tomorrow, today's Monday, so it's six days today, you'll be five days away, you'll see it. I'm going to get right to it for my bookie. Um, I'm going, I said it last week, I, I gave a, you know, I kind of gave it early, but I'm going to take the 49ers, look, it's hard, how the hell... I hear people now, I hear you. Teddy, how are you going to pick the quarterback named Purdy over a quarterback named Mahomes? I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Um, but everyone gets their chance to shine. And as great as Mahomes is, he's like Derek Jeter in baseball. Derek Jeter, when he came to the Yankees from the rookie to his first five years or so, somewhere in that area, don't hold me exact, but... All he did was go to the World Series and win World Series. He thought that's the way it worked. He actually thought, yeah, you come out of the minor leagues, you go into the major league, and you win World Series. It's not usually the way it is. Um, but it was for him, the team he was with, the coach he was with, his great talent. Same thing with Mahomes. Ever since he's come around, I think, again, I'm, I'm not being exact here, but I'm pretty close. 
I think he's, this will be his third. He's won two Super Bowls in his last five years. This will be his his third, I guess, in the last six. I'm, I'm guessing somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, chance to win his third. He's won two. And this is also a rematch with the 49ers um, from, I believe, 2020 when Kansas City beat the 49ers. Uh, different cast of characters, different cast of players, you know, now with the 49ers. And, but it is a rematch from that. There's some of the same, but there's a different, uh, obviously, change of, of, of people that were with the team that aren't with the team. And so it's a rematch of that where Kansas City won that Super Bowl. Um, I guess they're just about at the status that your team was where you could start calling them a dynasty. I guess they're like Kansas City's right about where the Patriots, your team, were. You know, obviously they haven't done what Brady and and Belichick and, and crew did and all those great players there with them. But... If they win three Super Bowls now in six years, uh, I guess that's a dynasty you could call it that. Right now, it's it's probably close enough to call it now. I just, again, how do you go against Mahomes? He's magical. He could do everything. With his legs, with his arm, with his brain. I mean, everything. He extends plays. He does. Give Purdy some credit, though. He's no Mahomes. And what is he, in his second year now? Um, and he was, what, the last player drafted in, in his draft? I think, it was, I think it was the last player drafted in his draft. Give this guy the no-name quarterback, so to speak. I'm thinking about the no-name Miami Dolphins, the last team, the only team to go undefeated, I think, all the way through and win a Super Bowl. Um, I guess it was back in the 70s where they had the no-name defense. You know, no big names, but just a good, solid collection of players that played team ball. So this is the no-name quarterback, so to speak, although he's getting a name now, Purdy. And give him credit what he's done. Like my son said, the scout from the, from the you know, the NFL, the best scout out there, Teddy Atlas the third. But... Listen, a father could brag every once in a while, right? And, and just say that. But I, he reminded me. He said he, you know, he, he nobody puts up the stats that 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 a Mahomes can put, even though this wasn't his greatest year. But Purdy, when what do I talk about all the time, Ken? You find out about a fighter when they're tested, when the moment comes, how they behave. When, when chips are down. Well, Purdy in the last couple of games, when they had to come from behind, when he had to behave like a top quarterback, forget about throwing a ball like one, when he had to keep cool and calm and collected and, and come back and, you know, act like a champion, uh, get off the floor, if you will. He did. He did. So I'm going with the, the quick breakdown of it, you know, in my head is first of all, Kansas City probably has their best defense that they've had. And then San Fran, you know, let's not forget about how good they've been the last five, six years, going to, you know, so many, so many, so many NFC uh, title games, winning a couple of them, I think, going to about four or five of them. I think four of them in the last five years. I think winning two of them. Uh, and now this will be their second Super Bowl, I guess, in the last five years, I guess. The, like I said, they lost to Kansas City in 2020. But they, I mean, so they've been up around the mountaintop, but they haven't quite gotten to the very top of it. And they're hungry. They're hungry. They, again, Kansas City probably the best defense they've had in the Mahomes era. San Francisco, also a good defense, especially their front line. I mean, they can get after you. They can put pressure on you. They can scramble the quarterback with Bosa's and, and crew. That's important against Mahomes. 
to get pressure on him, even though he still could break loose and do something crazy. But you got to try to get pressure on him. They have the ability to do that. And talk about Mahomes, and he's got Kelsey. We understand and, and, and everything that he has. And Pacheco, the tremendous running back that, that knows how to get those crucial yards. And he's so tough and he's so dependable. But San Francisco... They they have that running back. What's his name? Ken um, uh, McCaffrey. Oh, McCaffrey. Thank you. McCaffrey, he's unbelievable. And also, usually we talk about this with Kansas City, but even though Purdy isn't a, obviously the quarterback that Mahomes is yet, but, man, he's got weapons. Wow. He has so many weapons to choose to throw to. It's incredible. So, again, I'm, I'm going to go. Last couple games have been surprising. They've been defensive matches. Maybe the offense finally breaks out in the Super Bowl, in the big dance, in the big show. I'm going to say it does break out. But I'm going with San Fran to finally get, you know, finally to get it done. Finally get to the top of the mountain. Money line or minus two points? Money line, you'll lay a little extra. Minus 125 on the money line. San Fran on the point spread is minus two on my bookie. I'm not going to, I'm not, I, I'd rather not have to lay the points because it should be a very competitive game. Who knows? Could yep. be a one point game. You never know, two point game. So I'd rather not have to lay the line or lay any points and give up a little money. It's not a lot, yep. you know, so because I'm going to win a lot. I'm going to win a lot. I'm going to my bookie. I'm going to win a Not a lot, but I'm going to put a little something down on, uh, on, those, on those 49ers figuring they're finally going to get it done. Over under 48 points. I'm going to – look, it's been going – that's a fairly moderate number being that these guys can bust out, but they've been playing defense like I just alluded to. Um They've been shutting down. I mean, look at Kansas City shutting down the last two offenses. You know, Baltimore, unbelievable. They shut that offense down. So they've been they've been playing defense since obviously the 49ers too. I'm gonna go the opposite way. I'm gonna say as I touched on earlier, I think they're gonna I think the offenses are gonna break out in the big game and I'll go with the over. San Fran in the over. There you have it. Let's get into some combat sports action. Uh, let's start over in uh, the UK, Wembley Arena. Joshua Buatse Bu Bu from Ghana against Dan Aziz. These guys are friends, fr have a friendly relationship, sparring partners, rivals from London. I loved this fight. Aziz at times, obviously, he's bigger than Marvin Hagler, but he reminded me of Marvin Hagler with the socks and the short shorts and the kind of ball tight haircut. Um, every time I saw him, I thought Marvin Hagler, and he was right there in the pocket. They were exchanging huge shots. Uh, Buatzi put him down twice in the 11th with great shots. I mean, Aziz complained that the ring was slippery. Uh, it looked like he got knocked down with a bazooka at both times he went down. So judges had it right. It was one-sided for uh, Puatse, but man, that was an exciting fight. I loved every minute of it. How'd you like it? Yeah, no, it was a good fight. Uh, it, it was a it was a good fight. A fight that was controlled for the most part by Boatze. But but a good style clash, you know, two different styles that make good fights. Styles make fights. Um, it, it was a really nice clash of styles to make a good fight. Um, both undefeated going in. I and um, I believe Aziz was twenty and zero, uh, and and Budwatsi was seventeen and zero. He's eighteen and zero. Aziz is now twenty and one. Here's here's who he reminded me of, Ken. Um, Aziz reminded me of in, in stature, size, and of course style. The way he went about his business, the way he fights. Kwawi is who Dan Aziz reminds me of. Dwight Muhammad Kwawi. And Kwawi won the light heavyweight. I was there actually with Customato down in Atlantic City when he won the light heavyweight title 
I think he fought him twice. I don't know if I was there for the first one or the second one, but I know I was there with Cuss and Jimmy Jacobs, who later on became Mike Tyson's manager, along with Bill Caton. I was down in the 80s in Atlantic City where they used to have the fights the way Vegas does now. Now the way Saudi Arabia has it now. Everything is changing. But back then, the, one of the hubs was Atlantic City and for boxing. And so I was down there for the Matthew Saad Muhammad fighting Kwawi. Um, Saad Muhammad lost his title to Kwawi. And then Kwawi later on went on to be cruiserweight champ. And that's who Holyfield fought f for his first title. And it was 15 rounds. It was back in the day of 15 round fights. And where some people say the real, real, real testing of a champion you know they they call now the last couple of rounds the championship rounds you know once you get past the 10th you know um okay we're going into the championship round. back in the day you had five championship rounds you know and the real championship rounds probably if you specified it the real championship rounds were 13 14 15. That's when you separated the men from the boys, so to speak. But it was 15 rounds. It reminded me a little bit of that. Again, don't get crazy out there, people, and say, oh, now Teddy's comparing, you know, uh, Aziz <laughs> to Kwawi and, you know, uh, Bolazzi to Holy... <laughs> uh, calm down. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm trying to be very careful and specific specific with you guys so you don't misunderstand me guys out there um but yeah the styles really did remind me of that and Boatsi would have been the Holyfield obviously against Aziz being the Kwawi uh good good mix good nice fight again I thought for the most part that fight that you're talking about, Atlantic City, was in uh, December of 1981. And uh, uh, Matthew Saad Muhammad, he had a couple losses throughout his career, but this guy was like in so tough. As I'm looking at his record, right, after he fought... What everybody. Jerry the Bull Martin. He fought uh, Yaki Lopez, everybody. But go ahead, I'm sorry. After he wins, after he fights Kwawi, he loses by TKO. Then he wins by TKO. Lost TKO. Lost TKO. TKO win. Lost TKO. Win TKO. Lost. Win. Lost. I, his record is crazy. No, but that's the end of his career. Uh, on his way up, his early part of his career, um, the early part before he changed his name to, you know, and, and became a Muslim. Yeah. Um, but he was... I'm trying to remember his name. Was it Franklin? Um, was was it uh, Franklin? Hang on. I'm trying to remember. But anyway, Matthew Ma Maxwell Antonio Loach, alias Matthew Franklin. But yeah, his Franklin. birth name was, was Maxwell right. Antonio Loach, and then he was Matthew Franklin. Well, we're going real deep. See, we're, we're giving you everything. <laughs> we're going into forensics deep now. You know what I mean? But 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 it was Matthew Franklin. I remember. And yeah. like I said, and he. You know, he changed to Matthew Salman. But Ken, to your point, that was at the end of his career. His early career, he was, you know, he was he was undefeated to whatever point he was. And um, maybe he had one loss, but I think he was undefeated to whatever point. Yeah, he lost he, one, one six-round decision yeah, in like yeah. a sixth or seventh fight. Yep. But then, yeah, he went on a win streak. But oh, once yeah. he, he started to lose... This, but no, he, he won the he, title. He lost the title to Kwawi. Yeah. That's when he went downhill. But and that yeah. those fights took a lot out of him. Uh, but, yeah, but this guy, like, he wasn't gonna stop. Like at the end of his career, he went on like in his last six fights, he won one fight and was getting stopped in a lot of them. Again, God bless him. He's not with us anymore. But he was one of my yeah. favorite fighters. Uh, like I said, I was heartbroken when he lost. But um, he, you know, that's. Uh, that's not a bad little something for me to be saying to Boatsi that you reminded me a little yeah. bit of him. And that fight reminded me 
of, like I said, Holyfield and Kwawe and Boatsy reminded me a little bit of how Holyfield fought the fight. It was a simple fight to understand the geography of how it had to be dealt with. <laughs> Aziz, because of being shorter, because of being aggressive, you know, the, his style slipping, trying to get in, he had to be close to have a chance to win. And Boatsy wanted separation. The difference was Boatsy could also handle okay inside and outside. For the most part, Aziz could only get it done if he got inside. Uh, Boatsy put punches together beautifully. Uh, he boxed beautifully, controlled the outside beautifully when he needed to. There were ebbs and flows back and forth. But again, like I said earlier, Ken, for me, Boatsy was always in control for the most part. He was the boss. And... Um, but it was, you know, it was competitive fight down to the stretch. Uh, Boatsy pulled away. You touched on it. Uh, he scored a couple knockdowns in the 11th, right? He scored the two knockdowns, I believe, in the 11th. Yep, and two. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, one, one, the first one, the, the right hand landed, but he might have slipped. The second one was a little, definitely more legitimate if you want to question it. It doesn't matter. The 12th round... Uh, he he went after Aziz. He almost got Aziz out of there. It was a he. I thought he had him going. I thought he had him at the point where if he kept the flame, you know, at high, he would have got him out of there. And then he seemed to let up a little bit. And you made a good point before that they're good friends. They showed they showed great respect to each other after the fight. I loved it, but. Yeah which all fighters usually do and they should do. But I just thought maybe Boatsy, because of that friendship, I, probably not, but he just seemed to let off the gas pedal a little bit towards the end when he had him going. I really thought he, was, he had a good chance to stop uh, Aziz, but then he let up a little bit and um, Aziz you know, was able to, to survive and then Boazzi pushed it again, but by then it was just about over. So good ebb and flow fight, really nice back and forth fight. I thought that uh, Aziz could have went to the body a little more with the taller Boazzi who had a little bit of a thin body where he could have attacked it a little more, uh, maybe slowed him down a little bit, taking some of the ability to control range with his legs a little bit. But... I thought Buddy McGurk, the trainer for Aziz, did a good job of motivating him, pushing him, uh, making him step up the gears, so to speak, uh, because that's what he had to do. It was that kind of fight. For him to win, he had to, you know, he had to go to fifth gear, sixth gear. You know, he had to really uh, have, have all those gears working for him. He had to have the motor accelerated and... And McGurk understood that. And he kept pushing him, motivating him that way. I also thought Boatsy's corner uh, did a, you know, did obviously did a good job too. Um, they they told him, I believe if I remember, Ken, I think it was in the going out after the, I think it was going into the 11th. They said, uh, get us these last two rounds. Uh, finish the show you know, close the show. We need these last, close the show with these last, and sure as heck, I'll tell you, Boatsy listened, and he closed yeah. the show. Uh, that's, I think that's it for me, Ken, but a good, you know, a good fight, I guess the way I should cap it off for the fans out there, Ken, is that I I believe Boatsy is now the mandatory for either Bevo or better be of, I'm not sure. Do you know which one it is? He's he's the mandatory for one of the, I believe he he's the mandatory now for one of the, one of those great champions, and so the fans would expect me to say something. I really like Boatsi. I like him with everybody in the light heavyweight division except better be of and Bevo because as he becomes the mandatory for Bevo, although. Uh Although Bevel is obviously headed towards the uh, unification fight with Better Bev on June first. Yeah, 1st. exactly. Well, we got to see what happens in that fight. Who knows what happens? Of course. Um, but Ken, 
for the fans, inquiring minds, inquiring minds, right? We want to help inquiring minds, right? Um, yep. Bellacci's not ready for Bevo or Better Be of yet. I like him. I, I like him a lot. But he got touched a little bit too much by Aziz yes. for me to say, well, now I have to, you know, picture in my head that he's going to go in there with the a higher level with a Bevo and Better Be of, he's going to get touched by them. And he's going to get yep. touched more by them. And he's going to get touched harder by them. Especially better be of. So yep. I'd buy my time a little bit. See what happens, obviously, with Beaver and better be of in June. If that fight does happen in, in, a, in the desert out there. Um, and then, of course, you know, maybe he gets another fight in between, which I'm sure he can, and improves a little bit more. Got to get a little tight on defense. Uh, before you can tell me that he's got a a real shot against Better Be of or against Bevo, because they do they they do separate themselves in a the light heavyweight from everyone else. That's for sure. Well, that'll be interesting to see what happens there. Um, all right, let's stay with the British theme. Connor Ben in the U.S. I think he's fight was his was fighting in the U.S. for the first time. He gets a unanimous decision over uh, Peter Dodd Dobson um, from New Jersey. Uh, scorecards 119-109 and 118-110 on the other two. He came into the ring at a four, as a 14-1 to favorite. I think he was probably expecting, along with his handlers, for this to be an easier night of work. And after the fight, as a result of like not the greatest performance, he was called out pretty much by everyone in boxing in every single weight class. It seemed like everybody wanted a fight against Ben after this one. But, um, and, you know, and, and of course, Eddie Hearn was doing his best to sell all the fights but um how'd you like it what'd you think about Ben were you surprised that he had to work as hard as he did to beat um Dobson no listen I thought Ben looked pretty good I thought Ben looked we haven't seen a lot of him I haven't seen a lot of him over across this side of the pond um I I don't think he's been the most active guy um you could check on that for me uh, well, he's coming off the um, drug suspension. He was he was suspended for doping, and then that was rescinded. And I, I thought it was still being investigated. But let me see if I can find out what the um, yeah, please what the status is. Yeah, I, he was. You're right. A couple times, I believe. Whatever. But Dobson has not been uh, active at all, really at all. Um, came in undefeated, but untested. Uh, hadn't really. You know, there was nobody on his resume to say, oh, yeah, wow. But Dobson showed that he knows how to fight. He can punch. He's got a good shin. And obviously, he's very defensive-oriented. Um, I think it took Dobson a long time to get the motor running. And I don't only mean the physical motor, the mental motor of confidence, being that he's been inactive, he hasn't been in his level before, on a stage like this before. I think that all affected him. He warmed up around the fourth round. But Dobson, Dobson could beat some fighters. The problem with him is he needs to be more active, more probably serious about his trade, be more active in that way. Um... And stop being so sporadic offensively. He's got to be more consistent offensively. He knows how to fight. He can punch good. Like I said, he's got a good shin. Um, but he's way too sporadic. Off he didn't do anything the first three rounds. And it was all kind of Ben. Like, like kind of Ben was doing whatever he wanted. And Dob Dobson was, you know basically started to fall into a mode where you would figure he was just there to survive. But then, and he was. And then he just, around the fourth round, he started to open up a little bit. Fifth round, he had a good round. Um, he had a good round. He, he opened up more. But again, then he'd go back to being defensive way too much. And credit to Conor Ben, keeping him defensive. Credit to him. Is Ben the finished product to, 
to be throwing his name in there with some of the top guys, whatever. Is he the finished product? No. No, he still, he still needs a little. I liked him, though. He ain't bad. He goes to the body, puts punches together. You know, you can find them once in a while, yeah. Can he improve a little bit in those areas of defense, maybe? He's not bad, but if you're going to talk about the top dogs, yeah, could you could polish up some of that stuff in the gym. Uh, and, and again, by getting in the ring and getting one or two more to get, uh, you know, to get rid of some of those those kinks in the armor, right? To work some of that out, to improve in those areas. He's definitely not a f- finished product. But again, I like him. I like him. He's got a nice style. He's physically strong. He goes to the body well. He's got a good job. A job. He's got a good jab, uh, which which will make sure you keep your job. If you have a good jab, <laughs> you keep your job. You know, Ken? And yep. it's a hard, accurate jab. It really was the reason, probably, it it went a long way in keeping Dobson defensive because it was uh, it was it was accurate. It kept Dobson from really thinking about doing too much early on. Kept him off balance. Kept him discombobulated a little bit. Kept him where he had to worry about that a little bit. Um, Kind of a little bit like George Foreman with Joe Frazier, where Foreman, everyone saw the big shots, the uppercut that lifted Frazier off the ground. I've talked about this before. But that jab of Frazier, that phone pole jab of, not Frazier, of, um, of Foreman, really never allowed Frazier to mentally or physically or technically get started. Not that he could have done much because he was too small he was the wrong style for the for foreman as great as frazier was and he was great it was the wrong style for and and also that ali fight the fight of the century that took a lot out of frazier that took a lot out of frazier anyway foreman was great foreman wound up stopping him shocking the world at that time you know they didn't know enough about foreman yet except that he was knocking everyone out, but no top names. And he was a gold medalist at the Olympics. And it was, you know, it was great that he held that American flag at the Olympics. That was great uh, for Foreman, all of that. But Ben has, I'm not saying he's got a foam pole jab of Foreman. He's got a nice jab, a nice hard jab that kept Dobson really from getting anything started early on. And even throughout the fight, it, it, it reminded him, you know, it, it knocked him off balance. It reminded him there was something to worry about. Uh, again, I think part of Dobson's problem is he's been inactive. Part of it, probably his temperament. He's a very cautious guy, it looks like, that never going to be a, uh, you know, he's never going to be a barn-burning offensive guy that that, you know, is going to be throwing punches, you know, the way that some people want to see punches thrown. He's never going to be anything to make you, you know, confuse him for Aaron Pryor. But he's a, you know, Ken, he's a smart enough fighter. He, he's he got that, he kind of has that Mayweather shoulder uh, roll where he defends with that shoulder roll from right hands. Um, the only thing that he, he's got to match with it is the offensive dimension of it. You know, he's got the defensive dimension where he rolls and he makes you miss the punch, but he, he's got to get the offensive dimension where he comes back with the counter. He doesn't do that enough. Again, he's not busy enough. Uh, maybe he'll get better now if he decides to keep fighting because, you know, part of him probably not throwing us that he hasn't been active. He had rust, and he also had mental rust of not being as confident as he would be if he'd been in a ring more often. I thought it was a nice test for Ben. Um, at the end of the day, he caught Ben some good shots down the stretch in, in spots where he affected Ben. He, he really did. I think he even hurt him a little bit. Um, ben showed a really good shin. He came back, did what he had to do, but it did test Ben, it, it made him go rounds, it made him deal with, you know, with uh, what I just said, having to overcome spots where he got caught, where he got dinged a little bit, 
he had to do that. Um, I thought at the end of the day, the best round of the fight, it, I thought it was a one-sided fight that was interesting because there were spots. When Dobson, when he did open up, it was like, oh, wow. When he opens up, he, he can catch Ben, and this could be interesting, but he, he didn't do it enough. He was like the turtle that stuck his head out, you know, Ken, and he said, oh, yeah, there's somebody there. Hey, fella. Hey, little fella. And, and then all of, a, all of a sudden, the head goes back in the shell. Hey, where'd you go? Hey, fella. Yeah. Fella, come on out again. I, I, I want to talk to you. Uh, so I... I actually thought that people are going to laugh, but I actually thought that being so defensive and fighting basically to survive the first three rounds actually served Dobson in its own crazy way because when he finally did punch, I think early on, he caught Conor Ben by surprise because, again, yeah. he was so defensive that it's like Ben started thinking he was hitting the, the pads or hitting the heavy bag that nothing was going to come back. And then all of a sudden, when he caught, came back, he caught him by the element of surprise, like, oh, shoot, this guy actually punches once in a while. So I, I thought that kind of served Dobson in the fourth and fifth round maybe a little bit. Um, again, definitely a Conor Ben uh, fight. He controlled the fight. There was spots. The 12th round was really a good round. Dobson finally showed a little offensive consistency and actually punched for the whole round. Where the other rounds when he punched, he either didn't punch or he punched for, for just for parts, for fractions, fractions of the round, Ken. Um, yep. But the 12th, he finally did punch. Connor Ben was punching every round. Uh, it was a really good 12th round. It almost made you forget about how one-sided it was for the most part. It almost made you forget that, um, that there was a lot of rounds that weren't too exciting. But at the end of the day, Conor Ben's fight, I thought that I didn't pay a lot of attention to the judges, Ken, but it seemed like they had it really, 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 you know, big for Ben, which he, he won most of the rounds. But I, I think I could have gave two or three probably three rounds to Dobson. I don't know if their scores actually were indicative of that, if they did do that. But at the end of the day, nothing controversial. Uh, it was it was Ben. Uh, and and like I said, there was a, there was a couple rounds, the fourth and fifth. Uh, I thought that, uh, I thought Dobson did, finally did something. And, and could have won those rounds. Definitely the fifth. Uh, and and, and I, I made a note to myself. You know, I get where the people are jumping on Ben. He's a beatable f fighter. He's got flaws. But show me somebody who doesn't. You know what I mean? And he hasn't yep. gotten to the pinnacle yet. You know, I, I know that he's wasted some time with the problems with the suspensions and all. But... I, and he's not a product that's finished for the exceptional guys yet. For me to feel, okay, I take him uh, against this top guy, whoever it is. But mm -hmm. I, I, do, I do think there's something there, uh, you know, with a little bit, just a little bit more, uh, you know, addition to, you know, to what he's doing. Uh, on the defensive end, I guess. Um, and one thing I want to clarify is I said it was Ben's U.S. debut. I meant his Vegas debut. He'd fought in the U.S. a couple times before. Yep. Vegas debut for uh, Connor Ben. Yeah. Uh, they, again, the uh, Dodson defense was good enough to also, you know, allow him to survive uh, and, and, and have those moments that I talked about. Uh, I'm just looking at my notes. The ninth round, again, Dobson only fights in small spurts um, at the end of the round. Not enough. 11th round, Dobson landed a few big shots. Uh, good chin showed by Ben and by Dobson. Dobson, as I said, employs the Floyd May Mayweather shoulder roll for defense, but, you know, 
he forgets the offensive dimension. He's like a guy that you want a peanut butter jelly sandwich, um, Ken? He, he only gives you the peanut butter. He forgets to put the jelly on. What good yep. is a freaking peanut butter and jelly? Sam, what good is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without the jelly to go with the peanut butter? No. <laughs> you defeat the whole purpose. If you're going to go somewhere as a fighter, which Ben has a chance to, uh, I mean, uh, Dobson, you know, if he gets busier now, may, might have a chance to do you got a bad offense with your defense. But yep, 12th round again. Best round of the fight. Uh, back and forth. Thompson finally let his hands go for, you know, for actually a, a good length of time. And uh, that's it. I thought it was, uh, I was glad to get a peek at, you know, at Ben. No, it was a good, uh, good thorough breakdown. Let's jump over to the UFC where uh, Nasruddin Imam, Imamov and Roman Dolidze, uh headlined the fight night show. Good fight right from the beginning. Uh, it looked like Dolidze was, uh, would get the early... St- I'm sorry, not Dolidze. It looked like Imamov was going to get an early stoppage in the first round. He had Roman in, in all kinds of trouble. Uh, I loved seeing Eric Nixick, by the way, in Roman Dolce's uh, corner in between rounds. He always has the most entertaining uh, pre-round pep talks. But awesome, awesome fight. Scores were all over the place. Final scores had it for MMO 49, 40, 49, 44, 48-46. And uh, Ron McCarthy had it even 47-47. Very controversial moment in the fourth round. Imamov kicks Dolidze in the face while he has his hand kind of touching the ground. A lot of controversy about that decision, whether you should have your palm completely on the canvas to be considered a downed opponent, or if it's one hand like it is now, and I think it varies from state to state, which causes a lot of controversy. There's been some big um, implications with this rule with um, oh, the women's fight risk recently with Lexa Grasso and... Um, uh, I'm spacing on the name, but welcome back. This the 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 rule has come into play many times here, and uh, I'm sure it'll continue to be hotly debated. I see Michael Bisbee weighing in uh, <laughs> with an emotional response. People think that it's a BS rule that you can reach down and just put your fingers on the canvas and be considered down. But um, how'd you like that one? Yeah, Ken. First of all, when he did get kicked in the head in the fourth round. Imamov, uh, Imamov was, he, he was dominating the fight for the most part. He was winning all the, I thought he was anyway. He was winning, winning the rounds. He had to fight in hand. But when that happened, really, you got to credit Dolodzov, um Dolodze. Dolodze, I'm sorry. You have to Sorry. credit Dolodze with his toughness, his resistance, his resolve you know it's one thing to be a warrior uh you know when when you're the one who's doing most of the worrying you know and and <laughs> right <laughs> of course <laughs> right you know and you got the sword all of a sudden you don't have the sword the other guy's got the sword and you got to figure out a way to get the freaking sword out of his hand he had a choice you know he could have played the thing where he you know, goes for the disqualification, right? I don't know if yep. t- Herb Dean, who I thought was a did a great job, great job, the the referee, Agreed. great job. Um, as far as the get away from the, you know, that part of it, uh, the first round, clean counter rights by I'm involved. That's his strength. Count, um, being a good striker, a strong striker for me. Uh, he he was leading with right hands that drop Dolce, uh, and then he jumped on him in the first round. The fight really was about the first round, Ken, because yep. he, Imamov damaged Dolce so badly, dropping him with the right hand, jumped on him with the ground and pound, uh, looking for the finish. But again, Dolce was so tough. Uh, he 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 incredibly survived a ten eight round. 
uh, obviously a 10A round. Uh, Ivan Vorf, as I started to well, say. On the, sco- on the scorecards, only one um, judge gave him a 10 8 run- round, which seems crazy to me. I mean, the yeah. fight could have easily been stopped. So only um, Derek Clary scored a 10 8. The other two had a 10 9 round. McCarthy Sal, wow. uh, Sal Diamato. Well, uh, thank you for seeing that. I appreciate it. You know, I'll tell you, Ken, I don't know. I, I thought it was a 10 8 round. You know, I'm a boxer. I thought guy. it was I'm obvious. Not a, I'm not a. I don't know. UFC it couldn't have been more MMA, obvious. Fight could have been stopped. I know fighting. When I watch fighting, I know when somebody's getting, you know, the worst of it. And I thought it was close to where what you just said. And if a fight's close to where a guy could get stopped, I think it probably warrants whatever combat field we happen to be talking about. It probably warrants uh, a 10 8 round. Anyway. I'm of off uh his strength is striking. He 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 throws really a beautiful one two jab and right hand. And he and he mixes it up where he can lead with the right hand, he can counter with the right hand over your jab, or when you're coming in, he you know, or he can set it up like I said, with the jab. Uh I really like and he and he very relaxed, very very smooth uh puncher striker. Uh, he controls range very well. He keeps his balance really well. Uh, never really gets out of position. But Imavov, you know, he had a point taken away, Ken, in the fourth. You know, for yeah, that, for that. That's right. You know, for that kick. So he did have a point taken away. But again, I thought he, I thought he handily controlled the fight. Um, you know. Other other than that, I mean, I thought Ivanov, like I said, had a dominating performance versus a very tough guy. The fifth round, Ivanov was was looking out the clock a little bit. That 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 gr- grinding and grabbing and stuff uh, obviously was taking it was weighing on his gas tank, but he still dominated the round. Uh, and he does he does throw. Like I said, a really nice jab and oh, a really nice one too. Um, that was I thought DC uh, Cormier did a magnificent job as always handling the post-fight interview really well. Ken, yeah. when they threw a curveball yeah, at him, good. and and he's talking to him off, and there's no interpreter. <laughs> there was no French interpreter. <laughs> he, he he handled that, you know, the way pros handle things in a seamless way, in a professional way, in a smart way. So, anyway. Well, that's a wrap for the, uh, for the action from this weekend. Let's talk about some of the topical things going on in the sport of boxing. Specifically, uh, Tyson Fury, Alexander Usyk. Fight has been postponed um, for a couple of th- two, three months to May 18th. Fury gets hit with uh, an elbow and sparring. Looked to be a legitimate accident, legitimate cut, but um, never without controversy when you're talking about uh, this level of uh, fight. You know, Usyk's manager called him a coward. and Bad choice of words uh, to, to use to a fighter. I agree. You know? I mean, but yeah, what are you going to sure. do? Emotions, I, I gotta give, you know. Yep. Well, I got to give huge credit to Ariel Hawani for organizing a uh, 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 basically a podcast slash interview yeah, with all the, the man participants out there with that stuff he had um so on on a sunday he had Usyk, fury both the managers and the promoter the um the saudi representative turkey al sheikh and um you know basically they allegedly both fighters have agreed to forfeit 10 million dollars if either of them has to cancel the fight for any reason um but maybe just build a little more suspense. Like I said, it looks to be a legitimate cut. I mean, that would be a hard thing to stage. But nevertheless, fights postponed. Beautiful. I'm glad you brought that up. Here's here's my question to you. Because we got to figure this out for the audience. Because I know they got to be thinking this. If I'm thinking it, you got to be thinking it, right? That's, that's uh, how pretentious I'm going to be. And I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I try not to be. All right, here it is. It sounds good. Because one of the problems in our business in boxing is, you know, things happen, fights don't happen, they get postponed, this happens, blah, 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 whatever. And now that Turkey has chic 
is spending all this money as the host to bring boxing over there. And right now, make no no mistake about it, he's making boxing more relative. He really is, single-handedly, and, and with a few zillion dollars. But... But <laughs> it's but, it's, a, it's crazy what you can do with a blank check. Yeah, it is, Ken. But he he's making them more <laughs> relative. He's making people get more excited, giving us the fights or the chance to have fights that that our guys here couldn't give us. They couldn't give us. They wouldn't That's give right. us. And it's not like they don't have money, but they don't want to part with it. To to and they want to control <laughs> all of it. They you know as I would always say, you got one fighter on one side of the street top fighter another guy with another promoter the other side street they don't want to come together unless the money is so crazy because they don't want to lose control they want to make all the money now the money's so crazy they're coming together and and it shows you those fights could be made they could be made here but they don't want to part with that money they don't want to get to them so it took turkey alice sheik to come in and say okay I'm going to throw so much freaking money at you that everybody will love everyone. Everybody will be in the same room. Everybody will come across the street. And it will become my street. The street in Saudi Arabia. Box, right now, it's on the... I was going to say it's on the cusp of... It might be beyond the cusp. I don't know. But it's on the cusp of Saudi Arabia with Turkey al Sheik becoming a real hub of boxing, replacing Vegas, replacing, you know, in, in definitely in the United States, replacing all the hubs of boxing in, in, the, in the United States, in the world, um, that right now they are becoming that place. They are becoming a place where all the big fights might take place only there. Matter of fact, I'll go a little further. If he wants to take over boxing, which he might be doing already, right now he's doing it by really using the promoters, giving them money to make the fights because they have to fight us. He's, you know, he, he's using them to outsource the fighters. You know, he, I mean, obviously, um, he's using them. He, he is just understanding that uh, they have to fight us. I have the money. He's using them to supply the fighters, to bring the fighters, to make Saudi Arabia, his area there in Riyadh, kind of a Costco. A Costco of where, <laughs> where Costco, you can find everything in Costco's. Everything, where they, you know, they went to all the people that were the distributors, right? And they got them, they dealt with them directly. They got them to, you know, to bring the product uh, to Costco. Now you go into Costco and you can find anything you want, anything you need, you can find in Costco's. You can... Pretty soon, I guess, you're going to be able to go over to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and basically find anything you you need in fighters, you'll be able to find over there. Um, because the Sheikh is, is making, oh, I should say, Turkey, Allah Sheikh, is becoming the... The golden he's, goose. Yeah, he. I was going to say he's become the middleman, but he's not the middleman. He he is he is taking all the middlemen and that are the promoters out there, and he's again he's forming a you know a, a conglomerate over in Saudi Arabia where he's enticing them all to come there, which is not hard to do when you can tell them they're going to get much more money than anywhere else. And if he wanted to, with the clip of a, a, like the snap of a finger, if he wanted to, who knows, down a, down, a, down a stretch or down a road, he could eliminate the promoters and just become the one force of boxing in the whole world. He really could. 
if he wanted to. I yeah. mean, I, they got the fighters, but, you know, how much would it take? The, eventually their contracts run out or you buy them out or whatever, you, your lawyers figure it out. If he wanted to, he could, you know, he could do what the lawyer did years ago. Mayweather did. They left the Bob Arams. They left the guys that they were locked into that were making a lot of their money. And they felt like, well, I don't need them anymore. I, I just need someone to put on a fight. I just need a network. I just need a place to go fight and someone to pay me. I don't need the promoter to get me there anymore. I'm there already. These guys, that day could happen. I'm not trying to rain on anyone's parade, but I'm just saying that day, I'm sure the promoters realize it, that that day, right now it's great because it's raining money. But that day could happen where Turkey Alice Sheik, who is really changing the face of boxing right now, you know, I, I got to laugh. People said, oh, is Trevante Davis or is this one the face of boxing or is, is better be, or is that, you know who the face of boxing is right now the way it's looking? Turkey Alice Sheik. Really, I, I speak what, yeah. I speak what, for me, what truth tells me to speak. Don't mean that I'm the most truthful guy in the world. I, you know, like anyone else, I, I want to be better. Uh, it's a battle. It's a battle. It's a, but, I, I always want to put myself forward with saying only what I believe. What I believe for the reasons I believe it. And my opinion, and that's what you get here, is opinion. That's all. But my opinion from being in this business the way that I am and have been is that he would be the face of boxing right now. Because if he snaps his fingers and says, yeah, I don't want to promote us no more. I'm going to go straight <laughs> to the fighters. I'm going to go. I know there's, they hear this. Teddy, don't talk about that. Please don't even say that. But if he wanted to do, right now it's not convenient. It's not expedient <laughs> to do that. <laughs> right now he just, you know, he gets the promoters. They ship them over. They bring them over and he's got whatever he wants and he puts them, up, puts them on. But if he wanted to get, eliminate that middleman, if you will, if that's the way, right way to say it, he could, he could do it in a second. Where, like I, I was, like like the fighters, a lot of the fighters did, uh, including Crawford, where they got to a certain point and they didn't need a promoter to share the money with them. They were already accomplished what a promoter's biggest job is to accomplish to. M promote you to get you to the higher echelons of the sport where you can make the money the bigger money they are there now and these and and like i said if ali if turkey alice sheik wants to suddenly say hey i could just save some money not that he's in the business of saving money but i could save some money eliminate the promoters he could do right now the way it works though is that as he is a new guy in the sport, he's starting to understand some of the failings of the sport. And one of the failings of the sport in the United States, in America, in, in London, and around the world, is the sport doesn't have credibility. That, that, that it lacks credibility because, <laughs> because of a myriad of reasons. <laughs> bad decisions, bad judging, <laughs> bad... Um, you know, bad commissions, no commission, no national oversight, no unilateral rules that are enforced, right? Uh, the sanctioning organizations that are not, <laughs> that, that are very corruptible, uh, and that's being nice. Um, you know, that, that rate a guy, and then, then they rate a guy. They drop him out of the rate. They decide who's going to get the title. Who's going to be the champions? They who's going to get a belt? How many belts are going to be in uh, uh, available? You know, all of that. He recognizes that the sport, if he's going to be this involved, he's got to tighten up something. So where he's tightening up is the credibility of the sport, the reliability of the sport, where people. If they're told a fight's going to happen, in his world, with the power that he has over there, if he says something's going to happen, it's not like over here. 
<laughs> the, it's going to happen. And if it don't happen, well, you might have a, you know, you might have a little bit of a problem. It's going to happen. So he realized right away when this fight fell out, his worst nightmare that probably people have kind of told him about a little bit. Hey, Turkey Alashik, you know, sometimes you can't depend on these people. Sometimes, you know, <laughs> you're, you're going to spend a lot of money on a fight and all of a sudden it ain't going to happen. Oh, no, that ain't happening. So it happened. And what did he do? He went to what you just said, Ken, that, you know, he, he put out there because he's trying to eliminate that that part of the sport that has to be eliminated to make it more viable for him, <laughs> where it's dependable, not unreliable, uh, where it's got, like I said, where there's credibility, where people believe in what they're told, which the fans in boxing are so cynical now, they don't believe anything. If you if you told the guy, yeah, that's uh, you know, that's George Foreman, that guy's six foot four. Wait a minute, <laughs> let me go over there and check his wallet and and look at his ID because they wouldn't believe anyone in boxing. That's how cynical the fans have got, and you can't blame them. So he wants to deal with this, so he puts out there what you just talked about. Here's the problem. He says that to guarantee the fight's going to happen May 18th, it's the new date, that both fights will forfeit, should, forfeit, forfeit $10 million if they're the ones who pull out, right? Is that the way it's put my, out there? My, my, first, my first thought there is to sign a contract like that and have any viability is everyone putting ten million in escrow? Because if I don't let's think say so, I get hit by a, if way, I get hit by a car and I'm furious, I'm like, Ken, oh, I'll 10 go million, a step, get out of here! I got hit by a car. Ken, I'm you're right, paying. but I'm gonna go a step further. The way I read it, and tell me if I'm wrong, the way I read it was just simply he wanted to get something out there to to kind of calm the waters, bring back the belief that he's in charge, right? Because he's got to be in charge, and he's used to being in charge, right? And I, and and he and you got to be in charge if you're going to run a, a, a you know a corporation if you're going to run uh, anything, and he's trying to run big fights and possibly the whole industry at some point. But right now he's got to show he's the guy to run it. He's the guy that's going to have control over such things. So he does the right thing. But the way I read it was, if either fighter pulls out, they forfeit. $10 million. Here's the question. The way it's written, tell me if I'm wrong and tell me if I'm missing something. But the way it's written there, nothing about putting your own money in escrow into an account. Not, it just said what I just said. So how do you forfeit $10 million from a purse if the fight never happens and therefore the purse is never there? So how, how? Yeah, I think it's I think it's just for show. No one's gonna well, agree. Well, to that's that. what, the point. So what happens if I twist my ankle and I fall down the stairs? I have to pay ten million dollars. Anything can happen. Like I said, I don't think Tyson Fury intentionally. Well, if you sign that. Maybe you could sign it and have strong enough lawyers to do some. But that I'm not even going there, Ken. You're right. You're a hundred percent right. But you're being too logical. Because I think you might have said it right before where it might be show. I don't know. I hope it's not. But I don't think he means it to be show. He is trying to get people to say, not have to worry when he tells you there's going to be a fight. That is his That's goal. That's right. And, That's exactly and I right. get it. But my problem with this being a cynical boxing lifer <laughs> and, and, and representing the fans out there to the degree that I do or would, I would say... Be, you better be clearer. You better go down Ken Ryder's uh, right outs <laughs> alley a little bit. What he just said about, I want to see it in escrow. I want to see it in a, because other than adding that language to what you put out there, it means nothing because I'll repeat it again. I'll repeat it again. Forfeit. Anyone who pulls out will forfeit $10 million. How do you forfeit $10 million if a from a fight that doesn't happen, and therefore there's no purse to forfeit. So how are you going to forfeit even, ten million dollars of a purse, your purse, if that fight doesn't happen? Does I don't get even, it. As if you were advising or managing one of those guys, or you were their attorney, I'd say, are you crazy? Ten million, anything can happen. You could get bit by a friggin' 
snake. I, I don't know. Take your pick. And it could slip you're, on a banana you're, you're peel. Right. How are you going to forfeit? But $10 you would have to dollars? qualify that. You would have to exactly. put that. You would. You're you have right. Have to be an escrow. It would have to be would something have to be, that, a, at the end of the day, that a doctor, somebody, you'd have to assign somebody to be the judger of that yeah. if it was a credible reason to pull out. You would. You'd have to say, okay, here's something credible. You get cut and sparring. You, you, you fall while you're running. You break your leg. Um, you know, um, you're lifting weights in the gym. It falls and it breaks, it breaks a collarbone. Whatever. Uh, it has to be within a realm of legitimate reasons to for fight. Exactly. And then somebody would have to be the arbiter of that, right? And say, okay, yeah. yes. But uh, I, I'm not even going there. You're right. I'm glad you brought that up because you're, you're right spot on. But I'm not even going there. I didn't get there yet. I didn't even get there <laughs> because I just know what it says right now. It's kind of like having chicken noodle soup for the flu. And, and <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't getting rid of the flu, Ken. It, it might make you feel a little better that, that you know, it smells nice. It, it settles your stomach. It, you know, it's the first thing you ate for a couple of days besides saltine crackers. The chicken noodle soup, it, 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 it makes you feel a little bit better. It suits you a little but it ain't freaking getting rid of the flu. It ain't dealing with the germ that's inside of you. This ain't dealing with, with, the, with the problem at hand. The problem at hand is, okay, they pull out again for whatever reasons. How, do you, how does that $10 million forfeiture actually scare them into not pulling out how does that in any way uh, you know induce them to being less prone to pull out for anything how because again to me it's it's just words it, it, it's it's nothing of it's it's got no punch behind it you know it, it's it's just it's just a, a a statement that was put out on twitter that says okay and it makes you say, all right, this guy's not fooling around. And I believe he's not fooling around. And that's his intent. But how does it ensure to fight us to believe you're not fooling around unless there's true consequences? Those words do not attach to true consequences. They do not. So that, you know... The bottom line is, I talked about it earlier. Boxing fans are crazy. We're, they're all crazy. All people are crazy. But boxing fans, maybe a little bit more sometimes. Some Maybe because I'm around them and I see and I notice and whatever. But they, uh, I, and you know what? I don't blame them. Yeah, that's right. I said that. I don't blame them. I'll tell you where I don't blame them. Because what I touched on earlier. Th they're so cynical. They, they, if you you, you know what if you told them the uh, if you told them the sun was up they go to the table if you were to the to the window to see uh, if you're if you were a boxing promoter somebody telling them because they have been lied to so many times and disappointed so many times where they thought they were going to get what they wanted and they didn't get it and if they did it was 5 years too late and and so now if you tell them something they're ready for what's going to go wrong. They're, they're already, the, they're the Jets, the New York Jets fans, where every year it's going to be their year, Ken. I live around them. My son has friends, Mark Darrow and Anthony D'Angelo, all my, my son Teddy's friends. And they're, they're diehard Jet fans for, for life. And every year, this is our year. We got Aaron Rodgers. This is our year. This is going to be our second play of the game. Of the first game, Aaron Rodgers goes down and, and tears his Achilles. Out for the year. And the Jet fan every year now, it's going to, they're, they're excited. They're exuberant. All of that. And then they're waiting for, oh, but something's going to happen. Something's going to happen because it happens, and it does. So that's how the boxing fan. So when this 
fight got postponed for a cut. As clear as day, he got cut with an elbow. It happens. It happens a lot. It happens. Where in sparring, he got you get cut sometimes. And was it a very it looked like it was a pretty a pretty motivated, if you will, contested spawn session two weeks before. But listen, I've been there too. So I'm not knocking anyone. But he had a headgear on, he's sparring, he gets hit an elbow. The fans immediately up. Oh, he did that to get out. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> but that's where that's I so say I, you are out of your mind. And and the yeah. sport put you out of your mind. The sport that's made right. you nuts. The With all the stuff that I just described, with being disappointed, lied to so many times that, that now it's like, okay, yeah, I knew it. Because that's what the fans would say. I knew it. <laughs> knew what? I knew oh, the fight wasn't going to gonna happen. To think, I knew to someone was going. I knew somebody was going to find a way to get out. I knew it wasn't going to happen. I knew it was all set up. What do you mean it's set up? What are you talking about? The guy got hit and out. Ah! He hit himself with the elbow. Uh, uh, no, he didn't. Oh, uh, he paid the guy to hit him with an elbow. Uh, really? I mean, <laughs> the guy must have been a friggin' elbow wizard to hit him that cleanly and that like right between the headgear. But I mean, it happens. On. The headgear moves. It happens. But look, it happens by accident. I'm saying you couldn't do oh, that on no, purpose you're right. if you tried. Listen, Ken, I, we saw the film. We saw the video of it. it. It was a vicious punch. It did look like the elbow was up. It did make me. I'd throw the guy out of camp if, he, if I saw him throw that. <laughs> I'd say, I can't take a chance. I can't take a That's chance. You're throwing a, you're throwing a hook with an elbow coming through. You know, like. Like boom! I, yeah. I can't have you. I can't have you in here with my guy where you could you could blow a uh, this kind of fight. But anyway, the guy, the reason he got hit. Here's an interesting thing for you, Ken. We just did a fight plan, which now is going to take a little longer for the people to see it. But we just finished in Manhattan doing a fight plan for Fury, and and for for um, music. Uh, for the fight and it's a good one people are gonna like it i hope you love it i hope you like it and um we also did one for nganyu and joshua that that one you're gonna see on time hopefully if something crazy don't happen to postpone that fight but when we did the fight plan i talked about different ways each guy can win the fight and one of the things that i talked about uh ken if you remember was that, yeah, everyone thinks Fury's the bigger guy. He is much bigger. He's a giant. He's, you know, he's going to be the guy on the outside. He's longer. He's bigger. You know, uh, uh, I mean, Uz he's going to be the guy on the inside. He's going to be the guy coming forward. Well, he could do whatever he wants because Fury is very versatile. He's very athletic, as is Uzik, but very athletic for a big man. <laughs> and he can move. He can box, which he used to do early in his career. And then later on, he started coming forward in spots. <laughs> where he could be more aggressive and, and use his weight to come forward to weigh you down. He can he he's got a he's got options because of his athleticism. There's no doubts about it. But most people would probably figure, okay, he's close to three hundred pounds, two hundred and eighty pounds, six foot eight, six foot seven, whatever it is. He's going to wear this guy down. He's going to be too big for him. He's going to come inside. He's going to lean on him. He's going to, you know, He's going to tire him out up on the inside. He, he's going to bring that weight uh, towards Usyk. And Usyk to win, he's going to have to box. He's going to have to box a really exceptional fight, which he's very capable of, where he's going to, like he did with Joshua, where he's in and out. He uses his great legs, he, his great defense. He makes you miss. He pops you. He moves to the sides. You know, he counters. He gets off first. Uh, he uses his speed, his combinations. That's what he has to do. But I remember making a point, and I want to bring it out now, where I thought that it would kind of surprise people. After studying both guys and getting ready to do the fight plan, I saw where I believe Usa can be very effective inside with the bigger man. Because for the most part, I was watching where Tyson Fury's been a self-taught fighter for, he's been around for a long time and he's done great things and I love him for a lot of reasons. He's made the sport more interesting. He's, 
He's helped people make money in the sport. Yeah, I know people are against him sometimes, and who he's fought, and he, you know, picking a spot. I get it. But his promotional abilities, you know, since Muhammad Ali, nobody's had those kind of promotional abilities that Tyson Fury has to bring attention to the sport, to make the sport better in those ways. I know people call him a duck and all that stuff. I don't know how many times have those people. I just say one one thing about one thing about saying the guy's a duck. He's gonna get the biggest payday of his life. He's fighting like someone who doesn't punch like a Wilder and and some of the other people he's been in with. To think that he would be afraid or duck this oh, biggest fight of his life to unify all the time. Titles. You couldn't possibly be this level of a fighter if you were worried about ducking out of a fight well, of with someone who is moving up from cruiserweight, has everything that you want. That's the cra- of all the crazy theories out there that he's ducking this seems preposterous. The, yeah, I, and look, <laughs> those people saying it. How many times you've been in a ring? <laughs> anyway, I get I I get away from that. Okay, now. And it's your right to say it. You're a fan. It's your right to say it. I get it. But he, when I was breaking the film down to get ready to put out there for the fans and and whoever wants to go to my bookie or not go to my bookie, but just to have an idea of what to look for that maybe, maybe it's something you didn't think about. One of those things I saw as a trainer I would look to exploit the bigger man in his territory, his so-called turf, on the inside. I'd go into the lion's den with the bigger guy in spots, in smarts. You got to do it right. You got to do it smart. But I saw opportunities where, and, and the point I was starting to say to set this up was that for the most part, Fury's a self-taught guy. He's, he's got a good trainer now, uh, Emmanuel Stewart's uh, nephew, uh, the nephew of the great, great, great uh, Emmanuel Stewart, who, who is not with us anymore, but a great trainer. Um, so he's Sugar Hill. He's got a really good trainer. He's had other good trainers. Davidson, uh, he's, you know, who's doing a good job with fighters now, doing a good job with Joshua. Ben Davidson, you know, he came out of nowhere, but he's doing a really, you got to give him credit. I give him credit. He's doing a good job. But aside from that, Tyson Fury been around where, you know, he, he was never formally taught by any specific top trainers until maybe the last few years. So this is a guy who is still as good as he is He's still undeveloped in certain areas. Now, maybe part of it is he never really had to be an inside fighter being as good as he is. Here's the point. I looked at film really close. He doesn't know how to fight on the inside that well. He really don't. Like, he'll grab you, he'll throw the uppercut, he'll do that. But as far as any sustained <laughs> combat on the inside, <laughs> he doesn't really put together defense and offense. He does, he's not really comfortable. He's not really good at fighting on the inside. I can write, I, that's the plainest, the best way I should say it and could say it. And Usyk is. I think Usyk could take advantage on the inside, even though a lot of people say, oh, no, no, he better not be inside with the bigger guy. It'll be a mistake. I think if he does it right, he can have moments on the inside where Tyson Fury leaves himself open where he he really, truly gives you opportunities to catch some clean shots. A, because he, he's not really versed in what to do on the inside. And B, he's, he's not looking to work, so he looks to grab. And when he looks to grab, he exposes himself. He'll go and he'll look to grab. And if you know what to do in that moment, rather than stand there and get grabbed, you have an an opportunity to exploit something there, to really do. And I saw it in the clip. It's funny. We did it on a fight plan. People, when it comes out, you're going to look and see it. But on that clip in sparring, Ken, I, it spoke to what I was talking about. Like, I got verification of it, where he was holding, they were on the inside, 
Fury was holding on to his sparring partner with his left hand, holding him in, and then he was going to throw a right uppercut. But when he threw the right uppercut, what do I always talk about, Ken? Never give up defense for offense. He did. He dropped his hand to throw. He's a big guy, so, you know. But instead of dipping his shoulder, he dropped his right, because he hasn't been taught that for the most part. He dropped his right hand to throw it, and he left himself wide open for a counter left hook and, of course, a counter elbow that, that you know, did what it did. But, and, and again, a- affirmation to me that, hey, yeah, he's got these flaws on the inside where Usa can take advantage of that. So that, to finish up with the postponement part, where the people that, you know, said he did it to himself and it was, uh, you know, it was conspired to do this, of course that's nuts. But I get it. I You got the right to be nuts when you've been through all the mills of things that you fans have been through where every time you're told something, it doesn't happen. So I, I yeah, and the fans actually will, they kind of, they might be responsible for this in a way, Ken, because they might have, they might have made it happen by their thoughts that, oh yeah, something's going to happen. You know what I mean? They might have put out the so many brave la- brain lengths, uh, brave waves of, what, what's that old saying, Ken, where you wish something <laughs> into happening yeah. or you, you uh, not wish something, but where, where you kind will, of... Will, will. Yeah, you, you will, will something. They might have willed <laughs> something to happen by because every one of them was saying, oh, it's not going to happen. You know how many people came up to me uh, a few weeks ago? Oh, yeah, that fight ain't going to happen or a week ago, whatever it was, before the... <laughs> yeah, I said, no, no, it's going to happen. <laughs> not in your business. Not in your business. Eh, something to happen. <laughs> something to happen. It ain't going to happen. And so they might have actually, in their own way, without realizing it, Will this into happening by just sending out all those thoughts that, oh no, something's going to happen, and something did happen. Um, the fight will happen. I don't know. It did change the dynamics, and this is what I want to talk about too. You know what it reminded me a little bit of? Awesome. You know, people love Ken that I... Oh, they, I don't know if they love, but they know I love. I hope they like it. But they know that I love history. And to grab particles of history when I think it's worth grabbing it. Pieces of history and revisit it. There are places you can revisit in, in, in a lot of things in life. Uh, if you know where those places were and how to make them comparable. I'm thinking about Zaire George Foreman, Muhammad Ali for the title, the the one heavyweight title, just like this is for, right? The one heavyweight title. This one is in a faraway place. It's in Saudi Arabia. That was in a nation of Africa, in Zaire. What happened? The fight, they're over there training, just like the fighters were training in Saudi Arabia. They're over there training. (laughs) Foreman gets cut. The fight's postponed. Changed everything, I believe. I believe it changed everything. Where, I don't say Foreman would have won. I'm not saying that. Ali did his thing. The great Ali did his thing. Broke him down mentally and physically. But it changed the course, the dynamics, the path of the fight. It did. You can't argue that. I mean, maybe it would have been that way. People say anyway. I don't know. But it forced... First of all, it was in a country run by a dictator. And the dictator who was giving him all this money to bring attention to himself and to, to his little country there, what was his name? Moab, uh, Moabi? Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, uh, Mugabe. 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 Not Mugabe. Mugabe was a fighter. Hold on. Uh, a great fighter who fought, uh, who fought against Marvin Hagler. Great puncher, great fighter, Marvin Hagler. He was never the same, Mugabe, John Mugabe, after that fight with Marvin Hagler. What a great fighter Marvin Hagler was. He fought everybody. Mugabe was the um, dictator from yeah. 24 to yeah. 19. How do you pronounce his name? Mugabe. I want to say it right. M- Mugabe. Mugabe? M-U-G-A-B-E. Yeah, All right, so Mugabe. he's got the same name as John Mugabe. Yes, All that's right. right. Great. All right. 
uh, well, I I just want to be sure. I should not I should not have questioned you. I should have known. But thank you for bearing with me and double checking because <laughs> I don't no want problem. I don't want four hundred thousand people. Well, we got three hundred thousand uh, saying, "Oh, Teddy, <laughs> you were wrong again." Oh, okay, all right. Uh, so the the dictator did what dictators can do. Ali, Turkey Ali Sheik did what he could do to make sure the fight would happen. He came up with this, whatever it is, right, Ken? Uh, yep. Threatening him with money. You will forfeit money. Again, we don't know how solid that is. But he came up with something. The dictator didn't have to do that. Dictators have other options. The dictator said, you're not going home. I'm shutting the airport down, and you're not going <laughs> home. You're staying here. Otherwise, I'll kill you. I, I don't know that he said that. But he said, you're not going home. I'm shutting the airport down. And Ali and him had to stay there for the extra time, whatever it was. Um, and you know what? That changed the fight. I'll tell you how. George Foreman hated being there. Ali loved it because they treated Ali like a homecoming to, the, to their hero. To the, yep. to, uh, he, he, was, uh, he was the hero there. Foreman was the bad guy. He was the best. He's a and he's a great guy. But at that time, he had that ominous look, and that uh, he knocked everyone out. And he, uh, and he wasn't the most sociable guy. He wasn't the guy that the second coming of George Foreman became, where you know he could smooth anybody. He could sell anything. He could sell grills for two hundred million dollars. He could walk around with cheeseburgers and and make you smile. But the first coming of Foreman was that not that guy. He wasn't a sociable guy. And he wasn't happy then. There was nothing to be happy about. The fans loved Ali, the sociable guy, the great Muhammad Ali. And they sh he, was, he, was, he was miserable for him. So you got to be in the right mental state. He was not, that was not conducive to him having to stay there to be in the best mental state. It was for Ali because of what Ali was and because of the way he was received and treated there, but not for Foreman. So, A, most important thing, Mentley wasn't in the best place, 75% of it. But here's the other thing. You got to take time off. He was in great shape. From what I understood, when that cut took place before, just before the fight, Foreman was looking good. He was sharp. He was looking good. I know that he's, you know, not as sophisticated as Ali. He was still Big George. That you know, you could hit him. You know, he he was a he he, he looked like the uh, the mummy, like Ali said, who who you know coming at you, you know, straight up hit, just wanted to hit you. Um, not a lot of head movement, all that stuff. But he was very good at parrying punches, very good at blocking. But from what I understood, he was in prime condition. He was ready mentally. He was ready physically. And then things change. You got to know what you're doing as a trainer. He had good trainers. He had great fighters, former fighters around him too. Sandy Sadler, one of the greatest featherweights of all time, a monster. Uh, Archie Moore, I think, was still with one of the greatest fighters of all time, light heavyweight. But whatever. Foreman also probably does what he wants to do to a certain part. You're over there. There's nowhere to go. You're not going out to a nightclub, right? Not that you would want to, yep. but you're not going to a nightclub in Zaire. Um, you're not going out and spending time to get away from things. The only way you were able to get away from things was in the gym to 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 pass time. He should have taken time off. Maybe a week, maybe two weeks because he was in prime condition. Let the body reset. Let the body rest. Don't go into a second training camp right behind it, you could overtrain. I don't know for sure, but he had the look of an overtrained guy. I always felt that, that Foreman looked overtrained in that fight. Yeah, I know he was still the monster thrown over. I know Ali broke him down. I get it. But I thought I thought that there was a chance that's what happened because of the change. That is what my concern and what I'm putting out there to maybe educate the boxing fans that wouldn't know those dimensions of it, a little bit in that area, that that could be a problem. <laughs> Where the first problem is, will the cut have enough time to heal? It was a bad cut. It was a deep cut. Uh, 
You need at least two months for it to heal, inside and outside. Stitch inside, stitch outside. The outside will be healed, but the inside won't. So you need at least two months, maybe a little more, but to heal. That means two months before you can spar, unless they put that crazy mask on, which I, I, I don't believe in, because then, then, it, then it changes your training where now you got that big cage on where it protects the cut, you can't get hit, but now you get a sen- full sense of security. You're not developing your defensive instincts and skills, you know, because you get hit. You don't really, it doesn't matter so much. So you're, you're compromising yourself without wanting to compromise yourself <laughs> in certain areas that you're going to need to be at your best with that big man. So I wait to two months till you can spar. You can do everything else, be in good condition, everything else. Two months before you spar, you only need five weeks to spar, maybe even four weeks. So you need a month. That's right. so, so you're talking about three months, three and a half months. That's about what it is, May 18th, somewhere in that area. That's, that's exa- about. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think they might have went. I might have went a little longer to give the cut a little more time. I think they were pushed into going a little earlier because in June you have to be better be a fight in Saudi Arabia. So you wanted to separate from that. I, I just think that might have been part of the. Thinking, I'm just thinking out loud right now. I don't have any uh, information to tell me that other than my brain that, uh, that that's a possibility. I'm not saying they're doing the wrong thing because three, three and a half months, that's, that's about the right amount of time anyway for May 18th to be a, a feasible date, a safe date. Okay, I think this, again, I have no real inside info. I got my sources. You know, people tell me about how things were going over there a little bit. I I don't know how accurate it is. I'll just tell you what I've heard and what I also have conjured in my own mind from what I would from my experience. First of all, that right after the bad showing against Ngannou, Fury was embarrassed. He was he wanted to make amends. He's a competitor. He's a champion. He behaved the way you would think. He reacted the way you would think he would react. Where he wanted to he want he couldn't wait to get in the gym, and make things right, get better, and and then get ready for Uzik. So it was a wake-up call in a way. I think it probably helps him. But from what I understand, he went early over to Saudi. All great stuff you want to hear. He went over there and started training very serious. I heard his weight was down. I heard he was in really good shape. Uh, and his body looked good. There's been pictures. I don't know how authentic those pictures are. I really don't. I don't. Because the guy, he looked looked like a different man. He he looked like (laughs) Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I don't know. I I have no idea. They're cropping, they're popping, pooping, kicking, kooka, kaka. I don't know what they're doing. All I know is I did hear, and I'm not shocked. I would expect him as a proud fighter, as a guy who's overcome what he's overcome in his life so far and accomplished what he's accomplished, I would have expected him to react like a guy that's mad, a guy who wants to get redemption, a guy who wants to get to work. And so when I heard he was in Saudi Arabia early, I said, yeah, that's what I would expect. I'm not surprised. And he's and his weight was that, not surprised. He's working his backside, backside off, not surprised. I also heard that he wasn't... He was getting hit a lot in sparred. He he was he looked good physically, but he was having some tough. Again, how much of that's exactly right? I don't know, but I know there was a danger that in two areas for Fury. What I touched on with the Zaire situation <laughs> after Ngannou, he was so infuriated at himself to and wanted to get better. There's a chance he goes right into the gym without a rest. I don't care you didn't look good. You still got to rest your body before you start going into a serious training camp back to back. Just like you would races, Ken. You can't go yep, from one right. freaking marathon, Ken, uh, no, in Japan. Not at that and, stage And your then career. you're going to go fight, uh, f- uh, run a marathon in London. And then you're going to go to the New York for the New York and then to Boston. No, you got to have freaking breaks. You got to let your body recuperate. You got to reset. That's right. So what I'm saying is there's a chance. Teddy Atlas don't know this for a fact. I just know the business. I know that. I know the the fighters' mentalities. I know that. 
I know this guy's uh, a, a, a great winner like Usyk is and a proud guy. I know that. I know this guy's overcome things in life. I know that. I know the attitude you have to have to be that guy. And I wouldn't be shocked if his attitude was go right to Saudi Arabia or right back to, you know, wherever, to, to home and then train and then go to Saudi Arabia and start training with no rest. If he did that, that could be part of why his body looked real good, but he didn't look good in sparring because he could have been suffering some of the effects of overtraining. Possible. That's now, right. You now, can't make any judgments based on purely on no. aesthetics. Now, here's the next part, Ken. We are where we are now. Fight ain't happening. It's going to happen May 18th. Here's the same danger again, revisited in a different time time era, time zone uh in a in a in a you know similar scenario but obviously a different spot on the calendar here they are they got three and a half months to the next fight or three months whatever it is just like zaire the fight's postponed you were in great shape do you go right into training for three more months or do you let your body rest for two weeks you let your body rest for two weeks. Exactly. I don't know. See, that's where the that's the intangible here. That's the variable here. That is the X factor for me. That just like Zaire, Foreman might have went right into training because that kept him busy. That's he didn't like there was nowhere to hang out in Zaire. He wasn't happy. Ali could go out and walk around in the street in the in the roads in the in the jungles and everybody be coming out and chanting Ali, Ali, Ali. It was invigorating for Ali. None of that for Foreman. The only place that he was invigorated was to kill time and get past things was the gym. He might have not given himself chance. We we don't know for sure. But in this fight, the same thing could happen, where I would be very, if I was the trainer, I'm not, but I'd be very cognizant of that, very aware of that, very concerned about that, where, yeah, you just trained, you in great shape, now you want to stay that way, you want to stay in shape, you want, yeah, you want to keep going, you're going to go right back in it, no. You got to give yourself some, if you go back to three more, more you will get overtrained, if you're not already, you will. So that and Usyk's got to deal with the same thing, and I'm sure they know that. Um, here's the here's another X, the real. This is the real X factor. Fury is more liable to overtrain. Ask me why, Ken. Why? He's bipolar. He's got men, or at least they say that. I don't want to put words in there that that don't belong. But all to his credit, I give him credit for everything he's overcome. He has overcome. He he's very honest. He was in a. He, he's sometimes manic depressive. But so I don't know if it's bipolar, suffering from manic depression at times. It's mental health areas which none of us know a, a, enough about. None of us. We just know that they are things that have to be dealt with. They are serious. To the credit of this special man, Fury, really, hate him, love him, whatever, I don't care. But to his credit, I care about people getting credit for what they do. He overcame a spiral downwards where, he, very honest, he, he had suicidal thoughts. He was involved in drugs and drinking. He was going in a bad direction, and he got out of it. He came back. He had that fight with, with uh, Wilder, nobody expected him to have a chance. He gets dropped, he gets off the floor. A lot of people thought he won it, he gets a draw. That's why he's here today, because he got up from that floor. But he's really here today because he got up before he got dropped in that fight. He got up when life dropped him. When life dropped him, he got up. So, he's, and with all that, with all the things, the issues, the mental health that he deals with, he has still been able to succeed to the level he succeeded. That deserves credit. And now, from what I understand, his way, he doesn't deal with anything. The Furies, I, I, I love the whole crew, but the Furies don't deal with anything conventionally. <laughs> Can they don't deal with anything maybe in a normal way or the way that is supposed to be who knows because anybody could have their own way uh, just because one way is good for you doesn't mean it's good for someone else but 
from what I understand, the way he deals with his depression and these things that can overtake him, right, is to train and then to train and then to train and then to train that when he, that that's the way he keeps himself in an even keel emotionally, mentally with what we're talking about here. Okay? He trains. That is why I think he's more likely to have a problem. And that's got to be looked at by his people. That's something that has to be dealt with and has to have a handle on it because he's more likely to have a problem than music because now, again, he's got all this time. He's got these issues that we just talked about. How does he deal with them? When he doesn't train, they get a hold of him more. They That's create right. problems for him more. When he's in gym, the problems are less. But here's the problem with that. If he's in the gym too much, he might be overtrained for the fight. So I think all of that, all of that is in the air. I want to bring it. I hope some people appreciate Some people might say, I freak you, Teddy. I didn't, I didn't need it. Whatever. Good. Just keep signing up. Keep signing up. Keep coming and, and subscribing and DVRing and tell your friends to subscribe. Okay? <laughs> Sam's laughing. That's, that's all. Keep subscribing because I ain't gonna, I'm not going to do this with my buddy here, Ken. We got other things we could do too, right? So I'm not going to do this if, if those numbers don't keep going. If you don't go out there and tell your friends, hey, uh, five of you subscribe today. Ten of you subscribe. Uh, we're at 303,000 303, subscribers. Maybe it's 302. Whatever the frig it is. And I, I'm grateful for it. We work for it. But I'm grateful that you guys come and you do that. But I want to keep going. If, if I'm, if I'm going to keep doing it and, and Ken's going to keep doing this with me, I, I, wanted to, I, I want to get those numbers up. I want to get those numbers up. I want, I want 400,000. I want 500. I want to get to a million. I see these other people with a million. I want to get to a million. <laughs> I want to get to a million. Yep. So anyway, I trust you. I, I believe in you guys. But if you believe in us, that's what we need if we're going to keep doing this. So... I regress. God bless. I regress of Mo. But the bottom line is, whether you like what I say or don't like what I say, you're coming here to hear it. And it's my job to put out there different scenarios. Not just for the sake of putting a scenario that's different, but put it out there if my experience tells me it's possible. It might not be as likely. It might not be something that you would have thought about that would have been available to your, the first thing available to, to your thinking of. But it is something that is possible. Maybe even likely sometimes more than you would ever dream. So that is, for me, all of that is part of what is swirling around this very interesting fight, to, which is so important in boxing because it's the heavyweight title and it's for one title to get it to where it's supposed to always be where there's one champion at the top at the top of the heap where you walk down the streets and you say who's the heavyweight champ fury Usyk. you're not saying um mcgillicuddy and um <laughs> fitzpatrick and uh and and jones uh, oh, Brown has a uh, Brown has a in between interim uh, get ready title uh, belt. A, a what? Yeah, he's got some kind of what you might call it belt. Oh, it's a what you might call it belt. No, it's time to get rid of all that, and that's why this fight. There's so much is carried by this fight. So much is depending on this fight for the sport of boxing. Let's quickly touch on the upcoming fight this weekend. Teofimo Lopez, Jermaine Ortiz. Um, Teofimo's a minus $700 favorite, plus $450 on um, Ortiz. Uh, be interesting to see how Lopez looks here. He's had fights where he's looked dramatically different, better and worse, depending on what his uh, seemingly emotional state is. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, Teo does this coming weekend. What are you looking for in this one? You never know these guys that are undefeated 
I think he's 16 and 1 now, Jermaine Ortiz. But you never know, Ken, how they're going to hold up on a big stage with the top fighters until they're there. And we found out Ortiz held up pretty good. He fought a really good fight with one of the great fighters out there, still one of the the pound for pound top guys. He, he's getting older, he's getting a little long in the tooth, no doubt about it. But he's still, he's been a great fighter, a great champion, three different divisions. And. He's still he's still got greatness around him, uh, even though, like I said, he is getting long in the tooth. He being Lomachenko, Jermaine Ortiz fought a really good fight and showed us in his performance with Lomachenko that he can handle himself at these levels. Um, he's he doesn't he's fighting a guy who's more explosive and dangerous than Lomachenko in Teofimo. In a way that Teofimo, when he's right, like you pointed out, because he's, you know, when he's right, he's an explosive son of a gun that could end the fight at any moment. He's explosive with his feet and his hands. He can close the gaps fast with his feet. He's got that kind of explosive ability. Uh, and he can close the show with his hands. Lomachenko is not the punch of that level, especially after he stepped up from three different weight divisions. Lomachenko started at featherweight, went to junior lightweight, then lightweight. Um, so Teofimo is, uh, you know, is uh, it's just a more explosive guy, um, dangerous. But you touched on it beautifully. I always talk about 75% of this business is mental. Where is he mentally? You know, he's had a interesting relationship and has one with his father, right? You know? Yep. <laughs> and uh, where he's, he's had some things going on in his, in his personal life uh, that he's dealt with, different things, and, you know... I, I think he's just, he said some things where people haven't liked it, where they said, what, what kind of things is he talking about? You know, he, he's too full of himself, and a lot of people didn't like him. They got down on him. Then he goes and loses to Cambosis. You know, he beats Lomachenko, one of the greatest fighters in the sport, and then he goes and loses to Cambosis, who's a nice, solid guy. He doesn't get enough credit. But but it was a big upset. Um, I don't think it was his, he was, a, I don't think it was his best night. Uh, Tio Fimo, I don't think he was 100%, but it doesn't matter. Cambosis beat him. Uh, you got to deal with those things. He got beat. He also had a tough fight with uh, Martin. Uh, what's his name? Sandor Martin. Um, I believe it was Sandor Martin. Sandor with, Martin, yep. Martin. Yep, that's right. Uh, yep. Uh, so, you know, he, he had a tough fight with him. Sandor Martin's a good fighter. He's a yeah. good fighter that can give a lot of guys and has given a lot of guys and has been in there with a lot of good fighters, can give them trouble. So uh, a lot of people, they get down on them. They don't even know what they're getting down on them about because they don't even know um, really the, what they're talking about in some, certain areas where they get down. Oh, you should have blew out Mar Martin. You go blow him out, Martin. You go blow. See how you do. And and with some of these other guys, uh, they, you have no idea of what you're talking about. So I just recognize where Teofimo is a great talent. And uh, again, a lot of people think, you know, now after he beat Cambosis, then he loses. I mean, after he beats uh, Loma, he loses to Cambosis. They, they jumped off the bandwagon. But then he came back, you know, and he beat Taylor. Uh, in an in a really uh, uh, an easy win, uh, he he fought, he beat a good solid fighter, uh, and and beat him easily. Really, really dismantled him in different ways, you, you know. Um, so now he's back. He's back on top again. He's got those belts, and the only question is not how good he can be but how good he will be on any particular night because he has had the tendencies to fluctuate in the, in the mental areas where sometimes he looks like he did with Taylor, like he did with Lomachenko, and sometimes not quite up to that. And, and again, 
he's in there with good fighters, so that's part of it too. But where he's a little off. I happen to think he's a guy that suffers from the syndrome and where, and it's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing, but I happen to think Teofimo is the kind of guy that fights up to his opposition. I think that that's right. if he's in there with a guy, Ken, that he fears a little bit, quite frankly, or respects to the level that, you know, hey, I better, you know, I got something in front of me, I think he's going to be the best he can be. If he's not, I don't know. Uh, take your pick. <laughs> you, 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 you might wind up with uh, yesterday's spaghetti. I don't know. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, left over in the microwave. And it's still good. Actually, I like spaghetti the second day left over. I do. I like it better. There's something about it that it's actually a little better. And I love to make a, a spaghetti sandwich on, on two pieces of bread with butter. Ah, oh, oh, if you haven't tried that, try it. <laughs> you know, you have no idea what you're missing. But again, I regress a little bit. Um, <laughs> I He could be up and down. When he's up, the guy with the talent that he has, I he does have some shortcomings technically, Teofimo. He does. He he could improve in certain times. He gets hit with right hands. Sometimes he doesn't use the jab enough. That he doesn't do enough off the jab. You know, but he but he's got that TNT power. He's got that that neon talent where it can pull him out of a storm. Uh, but yep. s- someday you're not gonna get pulled out of the storm. Uh, you're gonna get stuck in a storm. Uh, and he and that they might have been against Cambosis. Who knows? Uh, but. Against Jermaine Ortiz, here's what Ortiz is. He's a guy that showed that he could be on this level by fighting the way he did with Ortiz, with uh, Lomachenko. He's not a guy with the neon talents, with the explosiveness, with the punching ability, with, with those things that catch your eye like T.O. Fimo has. But he's a solid guy. He's solid, I think, mentally, and he's solid technically. He better be solid technically because if you've got a nickname called the technician, you're supposed to be good technically. So he better be good. To, <laughs> right, Ken? If, you're, if you call bare yourself minimum. the technician, bare minimum, right. Bare minimum, you better be good technically. So he, the thing, I think that the Lomachenko fight improved him or should have improved him. I'm anxious to see how much because he's going to have to be really, really even better than he was with Lomachenko if Teofimo is at his best. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. But if he has improved off the Lomachenko fight, uh, he being Ortiz, I think it could be a nice competitive fight. And uh, and again, if uh, if Tio Fimo falls in love with his talent too much and just looks for the knockout, which he does sometimes, and just looks yes. for the big punch, which he does sometimes, if he does that, he could fall behind in this fight. He could fall behind and have a problem in this fight. At the end of the yep. day, what do you want? You want my picks? Tell me what uh, we're looking at. Yep, for the for the for the folks at my bookie, sure. Let's get the picks. The um, what did I say minus seven hundred on um, on um, Tio and plus four fifty on Jermaine um, Ortiz. All right, here here we go. Here we go. I'm gonna put a little peanut, uh, like Bill Krakenberger, the 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 great handicapper in Las Vegas. Um, like Alan Boston, who's also a great handicapper, but he's not in Vegas, but I think about the two guys. But Billy Krakenberger, Crackman, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna use his, you know, the terms he used. I'm going to throw a peanut. I'm going to throw a little peanut and take that plus 400. What's it, plus four and change or 400? Plus, three, plus 390 now on my bookie, but yeah, basically. All right. All right, I better get in first before it drops even more. <laughs> my God. As um, soon as I start saying Ortiz is good, what happens? His line starts dropping. You imagine <laughs> this, Ken? We, we carry a lot of... Uh, we yield a lot of weight over here, apparently. Um, That's right. We, 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 we seem to um, get hurt out right, there in small, the boxing community. S- um, small on Ortiz. What about over-under? For the over, you got to lay 260, 10 and a half rounds. Under, plus 175. Is anyone going to stop the other? Uh, what is the what is the round uh, the time? Ten and a half. Ten and a half. Okay, so I'm gonna put a little peanut on Ortiz. First of all, let me make it clear. 
I think that Teofimo is going to win. But I'm going to, you're going to give me those lines, or at least I favor Teofimo. But if you're going to give me that line, I'm going to take the plus 400 or so uh, with a little peanut, hoping that I catch lightning in a bottle, uh, that, that Teofimo's a little off. Uh, you know, he takes them for granted maybe a little bit, and I'm going to catch plus 400. As far as the under over, look, the logical bet for me, he's a good technical fighter, Ortiz. Teofimo's a good puncher, but sometimes he takes off a little bit in between round, uh, rounds off a little bit, where, like I said, he's, he's not using the jab enough. He's not doing the things to set up the knockout enough. Sometimes... I can see this fight going over. And obviously the bookmakers, they see it that way. That's why they line. In that case, in but, that case, no, you no, want but I'm gonna go by decision is plus 675. Really? I'm going to yep. take that then. I'm glad you said that. I'm going to take that. I'm going to take Ortiz by decision uh, rather than plus 400. Give me plus 675. Yep. I'll take the right. same same i'm looking for the same outcome so i might as well take yep. more money so i'll take more money on that side i love it i love that option with with my bookie good job my bookie i'm gonna take that you got <laughs> me i'm gonna take a little something on that forget about the you know forget about the four to one i'm gonna take the the six whatever 75 whatever and even though my logic tells me and the lines tell me they're right that it probably will be an overbet or an overplay. Um, I'm gonna take I I'm gonna take that buck seventy five. Is that buck seventy five I get uh, on the under? Yep. I'm gonna take That's the bucks. Right. I'm gonna take the buck seventy five in the chance, in the chance that Teofimo catches him and could stop him a little earlier. I don't, I don't think it's going to work the other way around, but I think there's a chance that maybe, even though I like Ortiz, there's a chance that Teofimo could catch him with the power that he has. So I'll do a little play on the under, and I'll do, I'll do a little play on, the, on Ortiz by decision. Well, that's about as thorough as a breakdown of that fight anyone's going to give anywhere on the internet, so I'm pretty sure we won in that department. But that was a thorough breakdown of all the weekend's action, preview to the upcoming fight, preview the heavyweight fight. Like you said, we got the fight plan coming when that fight does get, um, when we get like the week before the fight, we'll post that. Uh, it's a good one. But that's all I got, Teddy. You got anything else before we say goodbye? No, just... Uh... Enjoy the Super Bowl. I know that's a big event in uh, these great United States of America that, that has become a big, big, big partying event where everyone gets together with the dips and with the, those little <laughs> hot dogs in the, in the buns. What do they call those things? I love those. Um, pigs in a blanket? Um, pigs in a pigs blanket. Pigs in a blanket, yep, yeah. Yep. <laughs> you get all that stuff out there, and then you get ready for the Super Bowl to watch that great game. And, of course, you're looking to see those commercials. Everybody wants to see the new commercials. And I live on Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, the greatest borough in New York, the greatest people in New York. I live here. What do you think we're concentrating? What do you think we're ready for? What do you think we're waiting for? The boxes, the, boxes. the numbers, <laughs> <laughs> the boxes. That's all that matters. KC, yeah. Mahomes, yeah. Yeah, nice guy, good boy. Kelsey, good guy, nice guy. Uh, all that, yeah, okay. Uh, Purdy and or, or 49, yeah. Numbers, numbers. All the people on Staten Island and around the country, but Staten Island, I got to say, I got to say, I, I don't know how many people could top <laughs> Staten Island for pools. We we are the pool capital of of a, maybe the I don't know of of maybe a large radius of of play, of area, <laughs> but uh, it's about the numbers. Who's got the good numbers? Who's got the and then do the good numbers even come out? And so and right. I'll leave you with the last thing: Can Can the 49ers finally get it done? I said earlier in the show. I think they will. They don't only have to beat Mahomes and Kelsey, but they also they also have to beat Swift and the Swifties. 
Um, the conspiracy effect. Everyone knows the NFL has fixed the whole thing to promote Taylor Swift and Kels and uh, Travis Taylor Kelsey. Taylor Swift and the Swifties might be <laughs> more dangerous to, from the way people are talking, to the 49ers' chances to win than any tandem of Kelsey and Mahomes. And and uh, and I'll, right. I'll finish with, I'll put this in there. Finish with this, Ken. We were talking about laughing, and I and I get it, how crazy the, the boxing fans are that they actually, in their heads, were so sure something would go wrong. When it finally did go wrong, they, they said, oh, told you something was going to happen. I told you he found a way to get out of the fight. I told you he <laughs> hit himself in a, a, with an elbow or whatever. You know what I mean? He's got long arms. He can flip his, he's double jointed. He hit himself with his own elbow. <laughs> all, all of that. But here's the thing. The football fans, the stuff I've been hearing about the conspiracy theorists that you just talked about that, that think that this game's going to be fixed. So, so Taylor Swift and, and Kelsey and, you know, and the, and the Chiefs can get the win because of the Swifty factor. I mean, that, I, I got to ask you, are there, there must be a lot of boxing fans that are NFL fans. There must be a lot. I, I'd like yeah. to see the, who came up with it, it. makes me feel better about the boxing fans. You know what? When I heard that, I was like, the boxing fans aren't that crazy. You guys are crazy. <laughs> That's right. And when you're looking at the uh, commercials, my friend, last time I was out in L.A. in December, I was out there with my friend Jelly Roll. He filmed a, uh, it's for a Super Bowl commercial. So Does look he for got him one? Does in he the have Uber one? Eats commercial. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, are you in it? One. Are you in it? I wish, I wish. Nah, I was trying to be an extra. No, it's an oh, Uber man. Eats commercial. Tell Jelly that you gotta. <laughs> tell Jelly you gotta put you in it. He gotta put you in the I next. I know. One. I'm. I'm working on it. I'm. I'm working on it. Well, listen, guys. Thanks everyone for being with us. We'll be back after the Super Bowl. We'll break down the Super Bowl and the uh, Tiafimo Lopez fight. Thanks for being with us. Good luck in the Super Bowl, and um, we'll see you guys next week. Be safe.